I have some really good news. My friend Ed, my friend Ed that I just met, potential client, just wants to link up on LinkedIn. And one of my high school friends, Barbie, special friend, has accepted a friendship on Facebook. All good stuff. And then this morning, I got a tweet from my son, and he actually beat his buddy Jaron in a game of Scrabble on his iPhone. You know, the world we live in today, we are more connected than we've ever been. We have more information at our fingertips than any other time in history, and we live lives that are more transparent than at any time. And that changes everything. It changes everything that we do, most of it for the positive, some not. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to go back in history a little bit. Let's step into the medieval times. Because in the medieval times, for a man living in the medieval times, a wall around his village was a vast improvement, an amazing improvement for him. What it did is it protected his family, it protected his possessions, it protected his life. But most of all, what did it do? It brought him peace of mind. It brought him a peace of mind that those things were protected. And with each advancement, today we say new technology, with each of those, things got better and better. From a higher wall, from lakes that were the moats, lake-sized moats, to drawbridges and towers, everything got better for them. And they celebrated those advancements. They were confident that conquering armies and barbarians couldn't come in and pillage and plunder their village. That was an amazing time for them. They felt better. They had this quality of life they hadn't had before. And as it got stronger and better, life got better. That is, until the fires. And when a fire erupted inside the village, those very walls of protection became a prison wall. A prison wall that locked them in these hellish infernos that they couldn't get out of. And they died. And so that's the very changes of that new technology that they had at that time, from that medieval time, those, that new technology reversed on itself, and the un unintended consequences and vulnerabilities reversed on them and changed their life. So it is with almost all advances that we have in society. There are unintended consequences and vulnerabilities they bring up. So today, like mimicking the medieval man, is the airport security. You go through an airport today, and that security is set up to ensure that someone who wants to do bad to us doesn't get on the airplane. It's to protect us. However, when you go through the security system, and they treat you as a terrorist, and then they look at parts of your body with these voyeuristic x-ray machines that you don't want and it's recorded, you actually aren't protected. You have an invasion of your privacy at a level that you never could imagine before. It changes everything for you. I, I actually sort of enjoy it. I hated the idea that I was gonna, they're going to see me go through, but now I just love the idea that I'm standing there like this and it's taking a picture, and the guy upstairs in the room talking through the, the headphone is saying to the guy down there, goes, oh, damn, I got another 50, 60-year-old guy. <laughs> totally disappointed who was coming in. So we have to examine all the changes in our society. We've got to examine everything that happened, it, because... Like the walls, it provided and it took away. Like the airport, it provided and it took away. Every advance that we have provides and it takes away. And I want to focus on communications a little more than anything today, because that's really part of our society that has provided the greatest changes for us. It's really made us the industrial society it is. And you know, all these things happened, and they went on by us, and we're warned that we're going to have these challenges. We we're, were warned that things were going to get bad at some point, that things were going to challenge us. And we were warned by Marshall McLuhan in his time-tested thesis, Understanding Media, in the 1960s. So 50 years ago, he told us that technology gives and it takes away. It gives and it takes away. We just need to look at that and say, okay, well, that makes sense. But does it? Because most of us believe, and I believe many times, that these tools that we have are just simply neutral conduits that information flows through. They're neutral, they're not good, they're not bad, they don't change anything, just neutral conduits. They're sort of like a pipeline, sort of like the pipelines in our homes, where the water goes from one part of the house to the other part of the house. All it does is bring water. Who cares about that? Except when the water pipe breaks, 
It's just a piece of plastic going through your house. It doesn't change the water. You get the water, it tastes fine. Makes logic, logical sense, doesn't it? Seems like a pretty understandable way to look at it. So that all these tools we use, all these mediums that deliver stuff should be the same. The deal is, unfortunately, it's not true. That's not the way it is. Because what McLuhan told us, which I think we have all heard numerous times, is the medium is the message. The medium is the message. So that the things we use actually impact what we say and what we hear. So the things we get things through impact what it is. And the deal is that every medium can give us incredible things, but it can take away things. So as we see a new medium, all these things we have is we have to understand what it's doing for us and what it's taking away from us. Because it does take things away, and if we don't know what it is, it's pretty, it's pretty sad for us. And the rapid change that we've had today, if you think 500 years, it was all about printing. That was the big thing. It was Gutenberg's printing press dominated 500 years. What has dominated the past five years? Nothing. Everything changes so quickly. So there's a downside to Gutenberg, but there's a downside to uh, what we do today in a way that no one could ever imagine the way it happens. So McLuhan gets really passionate about this, and I, I think a little carried away. But he said that the medium that carries the message, or the message, sorry, the message that goes through the medium is about as important as the stenciling on the side of an atomic bomb. I mean, when you think about that, it really makes sense. I think he went a little too far, but I think it makes sense. That the idea that how something comes to you is equally important, sometimes more important than what comes to you. So let's get back to the Greek time. So in the Greek time, this argument was going on a lot. Socrates and Plato had this argument. As you know, Socrates never wrote anything. Part of his argument was about writing. Plato wrote things for him. So Plato writes this story about Socrates teaching a pupil. And the pupil he's teaching, he's telling him about trying to sell his story about technology. And so the story is about a king of all of Egypt, a god named Tammuz, and an inventor named T.O. And T.O. is an inventor who's invented arithmetic, geometry, all sorts of mathematics, and writing. And so the inventor gets to go and visit the king. He gets to spend time with the king so all of Egypt could enjoy this invention. So as he spends time with the king, he says to the king about writing, he said, I've discovered a means for memory, improvement of memory. It's a perfect recipe for memory. The king goes, no, you haven't. What you've invented is quite the opposite. Because you say this is for memory and for wisdom, it's not. Because it's quite the opposite. What you'll do is you'll give these people a tool for recollection, not for memory. Because they will become less smart. They will be stupid as they look at this. They won't be able to remember anything. You have a tool for recollection. As far as wisdom, they'll have all this information at their fingertips and they won't know what to do with it. They'll gain a reputation for being really smart because they have all this reading and writing, but they won't be smart. And there they will have the conceit of wisdom without real wisdom, and quite frankly, they'll become a burden on our society. You, know, you sort of look at it and say, yeah, well, King, you're right. Inventor, you're right. They were both right. And if you look at it here, it's the same thing with our digital advancements that we've had. It's the same exact thing. There are those of us who have argued passionately with our friends that all the digital advancements, the web, all our ability to communicate is an incredible change. It changes everything. It makes everything better. Life is so much better that I can text my 16-year-old and get an answer back no matter where he is. And if I got really evil, I could track him online where he is with his cell phone. But I mean, think how amazing that is. It's great technology. And I get passionate about it, and I've argued that. And I'm sure some of you have. Well, on the other side, there's people who say, none of this works. It's all crazy. It's changing our world. It's terrible. Well, the deal is, we're both right. It is changing our world. So back in the time of Plato and Socrates, they're arguing about literacy, basically. And Socrates was right, as he argued to King Tamus, that, that having writing really impacted people's memory. There was an erosion of memory. But on the other side, writing changed everything. People had more of a consciousness. People had the ability to really understand what was going on in the world. People were able to become individuals. In fact, democratic forms of government started and took root better in literate societies. That's the case because democracy demands that we have something to read and understand. So it worked. But on the other side, 
they became individuals and that individualism took them away from the tribe. So they weren't able to hang out with the tribe because they didn't need the tribe anymore. They didn't have to pass down stories to the tribe. Think how amazing it is. We're sitting in a room today doing exactly what Socrates wanted us to do at that time period. And just think how blown away he would be that my kids stay, stay at home and watch Ted on their computer, usually the funny ones. But that's, what, that's, that's amazing because we want that oral tribal culture still. We still want to be there. So the whole idea is it opened up a lot. It changed everything. And we need to look with both eyes. Some of us look at technology that, oh my gosh, it's the greatest thing. Others look at it that it's terrible. We gotta look at both eyes. We, we gotta look at what it's done for us and what it's undone. So if we stood in this room 10, 15 years ago and someone told us we'd have all the information we need at our fingertips, we'd be shaking our heads in disbelief. And not only will you have it at your fingertips, that you can go get it, there's these little bots that'll go to work for you. When you type in a word, these bots will shoot through the world, the internet world, through the wild web, and grab this information and bring it back to you within nanoseconds. And you'll have all this information you can do something with. I mean, what is shaking your head? That's impossible. The problem is, when there's too much information, or the wrong kind of information, the seeker of that information has had a reversal on the information because it's reversed on him, because he has too much, he can't handle it. He has the wrong type of information, and he can't deal with it. And so instead of getting clarity, he gets confusion. And that changes the whole thing. So going to writing changed our worldview. So what's the internet doing? It's changing our worldview pretty drastically. You know, hearing about what to eat and what not to eat. You know, there's that old saying that you are what you eat. So the past month of what I've been doing, I'm a tray of airplane food. I'm a little bit of the salad, the cookie they give you that's sitting there. I'm a tray of airplane food. And, but more true than what we are, we are what we eat is we become what we behold. So we become what we behold. And so what that is, that thinking patterns change based on the things we use to think. And I think if you think about this for the next few days, you're going to go, actually, since I've been doing stuff on the web and using digital equipment, how I go through a thought pattern of doing stuff has actually changed. So it's not neutral. It's not the deal. It's like something that changes who we are and what we do. So I love people that say to you, I'm a slave to my email. You're a slave to your email. Really? I'm a slave to my cell phone. How can you be a slave? You're giving godlike characteristics to an inanimate object. And it makes no sense. It's like saying, I'm a slave to my voice and my ears. How could you be a slave to your voice and ears? It doesn't work. Marshall McLuhan warned us. He said, we will shape our devices, and afterwards, the devices will shape us. I mean, what was this guy thinking in the 1960s? How did he know where we were going, what we were going to do? It was pretty crazy. So about a year and a half ago, I went to my doctor. I said, Doc, I'm losing it. I'm literally losing it, like losing it figuratively losing it, literally losing it. I'm leaving stuff all over the place. I think I have a problem. And knowing that I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac, that he had to have the conversation with me. And so he goes, so what are you doing different? Where do you lose things? I go, I lose things on airplanes all the time. I get off the plane, I leave my bag, the gate check bags, I leave at the gate and I go on to the next flight and I'm two cities away and my bag is in Denver and I'm someplace else. I mean, it's pretty sad, so I'm losing it. He goes, well, what do you do when you, get, when you land on a plane? What do you do? And well, I said, well, you know, I get my phone out and I make a call. And recently, now that I have an iPhone and a Blackberry, I put the iPhone on the phone, because I love that phone, I dial up and I get on a conference call, I call someone, and then I start you know, going through my emails. He goes, oh, interesting. <laughs> so well, how can you do that? I go, I'm great at multitasking. <laughs> and he goes, you can't multitask, either can I, you gotta stop. So at the end of the day, we can't multitask. We can't do two things at once. And these technologies are really changing how we do things. And you think about today, right now, the average person using a computer screen changes screens on their computer 37 times an hour. So 37 times an hour, you're on, you may be doing something for 20 minutes and then you change into something. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. So we have the world at our fingers, but we can't focus to do anything about it. And the deal is, you know, as Larry talked about dopamine earlier, we right now are totally addicted to the dopamine squirt we get when we get an email. When we see on our phone we have an email, we get a little squirt. 
And he goes, hey, fight, flight. Something's happening here, something good, something bad. We got to do something with it. So we jump on it. But it's, it's, it's an addiction, it's a lure to us. Not like drugs or Larry sex, but it's more like, actually it is like sex. It's not like drugs or alcohol, but it's like sex or food. Something that's really good for us, but a little too much isn't as much. So you think of the distractions, guys texting while they're driving, teenagers texting, train drivers. You think about the mix and the cut it does into creativity, doing two things at once. We have this diminished empathy because we're not paying attention. We're not there anymore. Think about Facebook and Twitter. What an amazing thing we have. It's a great tool, but it's junk food for the soul. People sit around and don't have relationships anymore, just like people who eat junk food don't eat good food. So you come home, you're hungry, you go into, go into cabinet, eat some food. You don't need really good food, you're full. So people fill up on that. It's a great tool, but you can't let it take away from you. So what can we do? What can we do? Well, first off, the digital devices are not a god. They don't control us in any manner. We control them. We invented them. We control them. So time to take charge. Let's have a conversation with our cell phones. So we could do more than a jailbreak. We can put it in jail for a while and say, I'm in charge of this relationship. But most of all, what we need to do is we need to be present. We need to be present to know what's going on. So being present means what's going on now? Who am I with and what am I doing? And I want to have a relationship with that person, not other people. So how many people have you had relationships with talking to and they're not there, they're someplace else? I mean, that's awful. And that person that's with you, how great that is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, got, I got to take this, it's important. Yeah, yes, sweetheart. I'll be, I'll, yeah, I'll be home, thanks. Sorry. We, we go out to lunch, we get a lunch finally with someone, have a lunch with someone, and they take a phone call and say it's important. What is that saying to us? So we gotta be aware and be there in the moment. We also need to know what's important right now. When we're, we're studying for a deadline in school, when we're trying to prepare for a TED speech, you're totally focused on the moment. So the deal is, know what's important now, pay attention to what's going on now, you own the devices. I've always had this theory of clean desk. I don't want anything on my desk. Anyone who's been in my office, no, I don't want anything on my desk because I'm totally ADD and that little sticker will make me do something. I now have clean email. I own my email. Every night it's all gone, it's delegated, it's done, not gonna get me tomorrow morning. You've gotta take over and pick your, pick your life and control it. So I'm gonna end with a story about another Greek myth, and it's Narcissus. So Narcissus, as you know, was an incredible hero, and he was supernaturally handsome, absolutely incredibly handsome. So Narcissus had all the women in the world in love with him, and he never returned their love, and that made them angry, as you can imagine. They're very angry with him. And so Narcissus didn't care, but the women went to the gods and said to the gods, we want you to punish him for being angry. And the gods answered. So they went out in the forest and they created this pool of pure silver water upon. Narcissus, after hunting, goes out there exhausted and thirsty. He goes and he goes to the pool and he reaches down and he's about to take a drink and he looks and he goes, oh my gosh, he falls in love with the image in the pool, the silver reflection. And he sits there, and he sits there for days. He doesn't eat, he starves to death because he's so in love with it. Now, some people think the Greeks are telling us that that is the warning against self-love. And Freud named narcissism based on this whole story, but I think it's a whole totally different deal. I think what it is, the root word for narcissus and narcissism is narcissus, and it means numbness. He became numb to his own image. Think about it, that he gave his image, his reflection power the power that we give the digital devices in our life that we should control, that we created. So technology is an extension of ourselves and we need to be present or we're gonna have, we're gonna lose relationships, we're gonna lose business. When we try to do two things at once, it takes us twice as long than do them separate. So I contend that we get control of our technology. It has far less control over us than we allow it to have. And I tell you, let's have a revolution and take back our lives. Thank you.